Um, this is the first training that we are, uh, thanks for sending out. This is the first training that we are um, doing. It's gonna be a series of trainings throughout the year about different communications tips um, and advice uh, with media relations and with um, social media and messaging. Um, so thanks for joining this. We also will have a whole bunch of materials and follow-up things like the link to this recording, the deck, um, and some other resources that we'll send around afterward in the next week or so. So don't worry about scrambling down everything that we talk about today. Um, and we also are gonna make a lot of time for questions because uh, we're gonna cover some of like, the, the general bases, but really wanna hear from you all about what questions you have when it comes to working with reporters, um, especially out here in San Francisco Bay Area. So we'll pause a few times during the presentation um, to either you can put questions in the chat or unmute. Um, probably the easiest thing might be the chat though, just because of the, the size of the attendees today. So before we talk about the tips for working with reporters, we wanted to start just about a little bit who we are. We've gotten to work with a few folks on the call today, um, but if, if you are new to, uh, if, if I am new <laughs> to working with you, um, my name is Aaron Eske. I live in San Francisco uh, and work at NNR. It's an organization that works with nonprofits only to help them with all kinds of communications. So media relations, social media, fundraising, advertising. Um, and these are some of the groups that we get to work with. Um, and I'll have Rebecca and my colleagues, Rebecca and Rosa say, hey, quick here too at the start and then we'll get underway. Hi, I'm Rosa Coleman. Um, I work at m &R on this team with Aaron and Rebecca and um, we are very excited to be doing this training with you all today and I look forward to working with you. Hi, I'm Rebecca Stubley. Um, also work at m &R and um, based in the LA area. Um, but yeah, very excited to be working with all of you as well. All right, thanks y'all. Um, so also in case the, the California Housing Narrative Lab is, is newer to you, just a couple of reminders. Um, there's this new website, and I'll put it in the chat, the shiftthebay.org um, has great resources in addition to some of these media relations tips, but it has a lot of messaging information and other communications um, startup materials for how to talk about housing and housing justice. Um, there's that. Hopefully that, that link works. I might've input it wrong in the chat window. Um, so just know that this, this resource exists. We'll include this in the roundup that we're sending next week. Um, but there's a whole bunch of great message guides and videos to how to use them um, that are available here for a whole bunch of advocates uh, to, to participate in. Um, so that's one resource just to, to promote. And then the other, I'll turn it over to Rosa and talk a little about what's going on on uh, the collaborative Slack channel. Thanks, Erin. Um, so we wanted to talk quickly about Slack. This is one platform that we use regularly in our work at m &R. And if you're unfamiliar with Slack, it's a professional messaging platform that allows you to talk to people instantly across organizations. Uh, and I just wanna do a really quick um, survey so that we can get a sense of this group's familiarity with Slack. So if you have used Slack before in um, your workspace, in any workspace, um, if you can just go ahead and type green into the Zoom chat, and if you have never used Slack before, if you can type red in the chat, and I'll just wait a few moments while people respond. You all are on top of it. Thank you. Awesome. This is really great to see. I'm seeing a lot of greens. Perfect. And if you um, entered a red, no worries, because we're going to talk about um, some tips for Slack. It's going to be a really important tool in our uh, communications going forward. So we want to make sure everyone is familiar with it. Um, and Erin, we can go to the next slide. Perfect. Uh, so just to give a quick overview of Slack for folks who are unfamiliar, what we use it for is really, you know, quick questions, discussions, um, brainstorming. We use it to communicate time sensitive requests um, like media interviews. And then of course, to share relevant housing justice news. 
Um, so some important tips to know about Slack. Um, one is that it includes the option to message the full group. You can message a colleague one-on-one. -on -one. You can create small group chats across organizations. Uh, and a large group in Slack, just for kind of terminology, is called a channel. So if you see that reference, that's what that means. Um, you can use Slack on your phone or your computer, which is really helpful. And then when you type at here in whichever channel you're in, that will notify everyone who is currently online in that channel. Um, so it's a really um, good way to just get folks' attention quickly, especially in regards to media interviews. Um, but what we really want to stress about Slack is that, um, you know, it's most successful when everyone's using it consistently. And to that end, we want to help you, you know, understand it and be comfortable with the platform. So Rebecca and I from MNR are here to help you with this. We want to answer any questions that you have about getting, you know, set up with Slack um, on your computer or your phone, troubleshooting any issues. Truly, no question is too small. So I have our names and email addresses here. Um, and please feel free to write them down so that you can contact us if you need help. And I will just pause a few seconds while folks do that. Perfect. Um, we will head to the next slide now. So I just wanted to do a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about in this training today. Um, oh, looks like we might have gone back one. Yeah, something is acting up. One second. We'll get back in the presentation here. Sorry, Rosa. No, all good. So um, just to cover what we're going to be talking about today, um, pretty much the two main topics are, you know, what is special about Bay Area journalists, and then we're also going to give an overview of PR tactics and tools. If time, um, if we have time, we're going to talk about pitching press, but we do have a lot of content to get through today. So if we don't um, make it to the pitching press section, then we will um, include that in our follow up uh, kind of roundup next week. All right, um, so if we can head to the next slide. What, what should we know about journalists in the Bay Area? And um, just a heads up about this slide, there's a lot of info here. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate that we're gonna be sending out a resource next week that has this slide deck, that has our talking points. So there's truly no need to you know, memorize this all or really rush to take notes, notes quickly. We just want you to listen and absorb it. Um, and then we'll follow up with this exact information. So talking about building reporter relationships, um, even now during COVID, um, the first kind of item is to show that you regularly follow what they're writing about. So if you send a short email to a reporter referencing their recent article, if you, you know, like and retweet what they're tweeting, um, if you're active on Twitter, it is best to use Twitter in this regard as an individual and not as an organization. And this is just so that reporters can start to associate your communications with them and your name with your online Twitter presence. And they're more likely to you know, zero in on a name because you've emailed them and you've engaged with them on Twitter than they are if you're just part of sort of a faceless organization. So that's one thing to know. Another um, helpful tip is to create Twitter lists and follow what's going on with reporters. So one really helpful tool for this is TweetDeck. Um, and on TweetDeck, you can categorize accounts and topics into different groups, um, such as housing reporters covering San Francisco, um, uh, state legislator accounts, and nonprofit housing organizations in the Bay Area. Um, and I'm seeing some questions come through the chat. Um, and if I can go on camera, um, and I have kind of a weird um, setup right now as we're all sort of working from alternative locations. So I probably will remain off right now, but for the, the person who wrote that, if that's gonna be um, an issue, I know I, you know, we wanna be able to accommodate all different learning styles. So um, if you wanna follow up in the chat and let us know if that works, um, and if not, we can, we can try to adjust. 
um, I'm seeing another question here. If anyone has a good housing reporters Twitter list. Um, yeah, so we can follow up um, in regards to the resources and housing reporter Twitter lists next week and kind of put our, our heads together on that. Great question. Um, so another kind of point here in building reporter relationships is to really be responsive, or one, be responsive, and two, be a, a resource. So in regards to being responsive, if a reporter reaches out, you know, always make sure that you're getting back to them in a timely manner, or if that's not possible and what they've requested from you is not something you can get to them instantly, just let them know when they can expect to hear from you. Um, because being totally unresponsive or, you know, ghosting them is really only going to sour that relationship. So as much as possible, you want to be communicative. And then the second point is to just be a resource to them. You know, we often think about reporters as targets that we're trying to kind of win over. Um, but when you think of reporters as, you know, you want to become a trusted resource to them, um, then you'll find that they'll start coming to you with questions and ideas and you'll build a really good um, kind of working relationship. And that is really what we want. And then kind of dovetailing off that is, you know, talking about um, connecting reporters to other information or organizations. So it's good to just always be thinking about how you can be helpful to their reporting. You know, maybe you know of a data report or an organization or an individual in the Bay that they should connect with, you know, feel free to suggest that. What might seem obvious to you about this field um, might not be obvious to them, especially if they're newer to the Bay Area um, or to the housing beat. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, and then another, another point to this is to meet reporters if you can, um, even just, you know, kind of doing a, a, a coffee over the phone. Of course, you know, in, in non-COVID times, meeting reporters in person is, you know, one of the best ways to build a strong working relationship. Um, but since that's not much of an option now, you know, don't shy away from setting up time to chat virtually. I know everyone's doing a lot of video meetings all the time. So if you just want to do a phone call, you know, that's great too. But um, we just want to make sure we're continuing to engage with reporters, even under kind of less than ideal circumstances. Um, so that was kind of the first section. Again, I know this is a lot of information, so thank you for, for bearing with us. Um, but for the sort of the second piece of this, um, it really is talking about kind of the art of reporter follow-up. And, you know, I just will put a caveat at the beginning here to, to say that all reporters are different and how reporters like to work with folks, like to work with their sources, how they prefer to be communicated with, whether that's over text or email or a phone call, it varies so much. It's not a kind of one size fits all, but that's that's why as you get to know reporters, you'll you'll start to understand kind of how they work and be able to best kind of meet them where where they're at. So kind of the first piece to this, you know, reporter follow up is that, you know, your pitching doesn't end once you've sent an email. It's not just about one story. The goal here is really to build a strong working relationship so that you can be a resource going forward. Uh, the second piece here is that phone calls still work. <laughs> the best way to get a hold of reporters sometimes is definitely a phone call or even text. So don't be afraid to use those, those methods to follow up if you haven't heard back um, from an email. But if you are emailing, it's really best to keep it short and sweet. Um, and along those lines, subject lines are really important. So, you know, you want to make sure your, your subject line is snappy, that it's going to stand out in a crowded inbox. And just be thinking before you're sending it about what's going to grab the reporter's eye. You know, it's going to be the name of someone that they already know, whether that's, you know, a politician or someone in the community. It's going to be an interesting or timely new fact, you know, uh, a unique kind of assertion or take on something that's going on. And then when relevant, you know, don't shy away from putting new in all caps before the rest of the subject line, just to kind of capture their attention. And then the last piece here um, is just uh, to make sure you kind of space out your communications and follow up with new information or tie it to current events. So in other words, when you, you know, are reaching out, just make sure that there's a real purpose behind it. Maybe you're thanking them for a story that they did. Maybe you're following up with new data 
or relevant information, or you're you know, connecting the dots for them about how something is related to a current event or a recent policy change. Um, but just make sure there's a pretty clear kind of purpose behind your communication. And then finally, you know, just this is pretty obvious, but just remember that reporters are, you know, busy and stressed and human. They're living through, you know, this kind of wild time, just like we are. So even if they don't reply to your email or they don't use you or your suggested source for one story that they're working on, don't assume that means that you reaching out isn't relevant or helpful. Definitely keep reaching out. And we can go to uh, the next slide. So, you know, one thing that we really wanted to highlight in this presentation is that local community voices of people who are impacted by what is going on with this housing crisis are extremely important to Bay Area reporters. We have heard this over and over from journalists in the Bay. They want to tell stories of community members impacted by the bigger decisions that they're reporting on. So this is, you know, whether this is the housing crisis, climate change, COVID, of course, these are all connected. Um, and they want to be able to really tell those stories authentically. And, you know, journalism that respectfully includes impacted voices is journalism that engages people and gets them to read their stories and think about their relationship to these stories and to the broader community and the broader world. So that's why whenever possible, we really want to connect journalists with folks on the ground who are willing to speak with them. So just really wanted to highlight that in this presentation. Um, and now I will turn it back over to Aaron for a bit to talk about the, the somewhat confusing solar system um, of Bay Area media. Thanks, Rosa. And I put in chat the link to, it was actually a Hamilton Family's produced video that ended up being a New York Times op doc, which is like their opinion, video opinion pieces. So I put that in the chat. It's a really powerful, um, powerful piece of storytelling just to you look to it for example. Um, so yeah, the solar system of Bay Area media, I've lived here for 11 years now, I'm out in the Bay and like I, it, the media landscape has changed a lot during that time. But even since the beginning, I was confused about like, why is, why is there SF Gate and the Chronicle? What's the deal? Um, who works where? It can be really confusing sometimes when like you write to a reporter who you think works for San Jose Mercury News, but then they reply back or that story ends up, they reply back from a, a different email account or the story ends up appearing in the East Bay Times instead. So this is just like unwinding a little bit of who owns what in the, and who works where in the Bay Area, um, like the big news, big newspapers. So the Bay Area News Group, I think it consolidated about five or six years ago. There's a whole bunch of like media, local media acquisitions and shakeups. And what happened was, um, the Mercury News down in San Jose and the, the Peninsula kind of co joined forces with what was the Oakland Tribune um, and then turned into the East Bay Times and then up in Moran. So those three papers are owned by the same company and they share the Bay Area News Group and they share a lot of resources and a lot of times they also will cross publish op-eds, they'll cross publish news stories. Um, so it just if you were wondering like what is the deal with that i don't have all the answers but um i do know that those those three are really interconnected and the reporters at those outlets talk to each other quite a bit too they operate like one team even though they will um sometimes be labeled as like a reporter at one and then you are surprised that it appears elsewhere so that's the Bay Area news group story the San Francisco Chronicle and SF Gates story is even more of a mystery. Um, they're both owned by Hearst. And what happened was the San Francisco Chronicle became one of the first local newspapers to publish online for like 20, 25 years ago. And that's when they created SF Gate. They thought, oh, well, we should have a different name <laughs> for our web, our web presence. Um, so it kind of became its own spinoff thing, even though the reporters to this day tend to have a crossover between the two outlets. One outlet, they both now have their own websites. One of them, you'll probably reach the paywall pretty quick on the Chronicles website, um, whereas SFGate has a more open access. So 
that doesn't unwind all of mystery, but in case you're like, what is the deal? Um, <laughs> the, the, there's a deal that there's some money basically is <laughs> happening to, with the ownership. Um, and so they, they have a different, the SF gate has a different subscription and advertiser strategy than the Chronicle does, even though they have a lot of the same people working in both places. <laughs> yes, and SF gate also has gardening tips and, um, how to fix your oven or something. We have a lot of how-tos for some reason. So who knew? Um, so that's a little bit of just unwinding the mystery of the place. Like it, when you look at like Los Angeles, they don't have the same sort of twisted um, twisted cross ownership and publishing. Um, another thing that we really wanted to emphasize here is that yes, those are the big papers. We'll talk a little bit about reach in a second and what the audience sizes for different outlets, but these smaller local targeted outlets as well. And there's plenty that we have five on here. So I'll take a lote, uh, spotlight down in San Jose, Oakland side, and now the new Berkeley side. Um, Mission Local has been around for so long and they've really built up their credibility. And then um, the Bayview, also in SF, is an institutional paper. Um, and all of these are they may not have the same reach or like the same recognition, um, like word of mouth recognition that a lot of other papers do, but the reporters who work at local TV stations, the reporters who work at the Chronicle and the Mercury News, they follow these outlets too. And it's a very small press corps and everyone in the, the Bay Area press corps kind of knows each other and they look to each other's work. Um, it's pretty collaborative. And so these outlets may not have the, you know, 200,000 readers on a, any given story, um, but they can be really influential in reaching policymakers and reaching other thought leaders and other people in the news media. So this is the, the peak of bullet reach. We took this from um, the Chronicle and SF Gates own ad sheet. <laughs> so they're a little biased. They want to say they have the largest audience. Um, but this gives you a bit of a breakdown of who's going to whose websites. So this doesn't tell you who listens to KQED. I'm sure KQED would be like, well, we have more listeners than we have website visitors. But it gives you a general sense of which outlets have largest to smallest audience when it comes to least web tracking. Um, so the they're pretty consistent and I don't know for sure, but my guess is the outlets like Mission Local um, are more in the like 100,000, 200,000 visits a month round. So kind of a, a waterfall of audience size down, um, down the line here. Okay. This next one is just another tip when it comes to um, reaching out to reporters at these outlets, especially the Bay Area News Group, where it's just kind of a, a jumble of different outlets. So we have found that it's totally okay to write to more than one reporter at one outlet at a time. Um, and if there's, again, this kind of goes to that collaborative spirit in newsrooms around here. Um, Sometimes, yeah, we'll write to reporters individually, but if we wanted to get somebody, this is an example of a recent email that we were sending to folks over at Berkeley side. Um, we didn't know who was gonna be the best person there because they have so many people who cover housing because it's such an important issue in the Bay Area. So we sent it to the whole trio of reporters who we thought could care. Um, and we, you know, they, they all were kind of engaging on this email chain. Um, so it's fine to have everybody in the loop and it's, it's less of a exclusive competitive spirit out here. And then the last tip for reaching out to the Bay Area media is um, those outlets that we were talking about were predominantly online outlets and classic newspapers and a lot of the reason for that is because the TV, I mean, there's plenty of TV stations here. Um, we have found though, that when it comes to breaking through with more serious issues and reporting, the TV stations are probably not the best bet. Um, we find that the, the deeper reporting is really more with the written outlets or the radio stations. Um, there's a couple exceptions that are 
that are on the screen here. Like there's a couple of interview segments where advocates go and talk about housing in the Bay Area, that could be powerful. Um, also the TV crews love when there's something to point the camera at. So a lot of the housing activism around, um, around the, the buses to the peninsula from San Francisco, TV crews loved that, but it really didn't so much talk about and provide the advocate and the, the impact of community voices and the story. Um, so it could be a place to work at and getting to have those deeper conversations on TV stations, but the, the general operating mode right now is TV keeps stuff pretty surface when it comes to housing issues. Okay, um, I have not been keeping an eye on the chat, so we can go back and see if there's questions that came up there. Um, and also, if you hadn't asked any questions yet and you wanted to know something about working with Bay Area reporters, um, please add questions in there to the chat. We'll go we'll spend lots of time on that now before moving to the next section of some general background information about uh, PR. Let's see, Rosa or Rebecca, are there any questions that are rising up while I'm like scrolling back up through the chat? I think um, we've got a question um, up here towards the top from Leora. Does anyone know who is going to replace Susie Steinle? Um, Leora, do you mind putting which um, outlet Susie's with in the chat? I'm not remembering off the top of my head. Oh, KPIX. Okay, this is a question kind of to the broader group. So if any folks know, feel free to weigh in. And then I see a comment from Corey here on TV station reception that they're often really interested in surface level coverage and that typically um, that folks have only had success when big names have been involved. And if other folks have, you know, other kind of affirmations or comments to, to put in the chat, feel free to share those as well. Cool. And a new question from um, Dan about how much time to put into nurturing these relationships. Um, oh, yeah, especially if you don't have anything that is like brand new news. Um, I mean, so much of it depends on what your organizational goals are but if you want to be participating in shifting this narrative about housing so it's less about what the zillow numbers say and more about who's going to be impacted by not having enough housing in the bay area um i think it's, it is it is important and you know it can feel really daunting um but i think that if you think about it as more of just a like a, a long term little bits here and there it becomes less daunting so if it's about like 10 minutes a day, looking at those Twitter lists that Rosa was talking about and doing retweets and putting a little, punching a little heart button on a, on a, on a housing story that you like that a reporter from the a local outlet that you've got your eye on and thinks doing good work, like that doesn't take too much time and that could have a bigger, um, bigger impact. And then like sending a note every couple two to three months to out just in reply to an article they write um, that you thought was really interesting or insightful or powerful. Like, so it doesn't take that much time. It's just more of having it on the back of your mind um, can be a, a bit of a headspace. It takes more headspace and it takes time probably. And it looks like we've got another kind of question here from Misha about um, opportunity or value to um, kind of approaching um, editors at the SF Chronicle or, you know, kind of with the Bay Area News Group. Erin, did you want to speak to that? Let's see. Oh, I would say yes. Yeah. So the, uh, the kinds of outreach that you're making to folks at KQED or at nonprofit press outlets, I think are totally worth reaching out to folks at more of the, the corporate owned. I think what, what we have found, and Rose made this point too, with like the, the well, I think it's, yeah, the, the uh, reporters in the Bay Area are, um, 
that they are facing a lot of these issues themselves. And so um, I think reporters are really empathetic and understanding um, who work at some of the, the bigger name outlets. I don't think they think of themselves as like these like press elite. Um, I think that they think of themselves like really understanding what it's like to, to live in the Bay Area. So yeah, if you the approach that you're taking that are that's working to make inroads with um, producers and reporters at KQED, I would do the same thing with the other outlets. I am seeing another question um, from Leora about what's a good way to convince folks to share their stories with reporters. Um, I'm seeing Dan's comment on that too, feeling hesitant to ask residents to speak to reporters. It's a big ask. Absolutely. Um, yes. Totally hear you on that. And I think this is something that, you know, we want to be mindful of and that kind of can look different for people in all different roles and depending on their relationships with residents. Um, and so, you know, if you have personal relationships with, with folks, I would just sort of, you know, not approach it from um, kind of what like we're trying to, to get from you necessarily, um, but more of, I don't know, kind of putting it out there as a potential opportunity um, to, I don't know if this will work for everyone, but maybe to, to almost have some, some agency over, over their situation and what they're dealing with to say, you know, I understand where you're coming from and where, where you're at. And, you know, we want to make sure other people know about this because there are folks working on this and, you know, they want to do what they can to help you and change policy and, and be an advocate and hearing your story would help with that. You know, is this something you're open to and just being pretty gentle about it. Um, but there's certainly many folks who are experiencing the myriad of issues that we're talking about who aren't comfortable talking to reporters um, and, and that's totally fine. And that's not something that we ever need to push. Um, and so I think it's just kind of a one-on-one um, -on -one approach of, of just, you know, if you're working with folks on the ground, you know them better than anyone else. So I would just follow their lead because um, we don't want to be pushy. And it is, of course, helpful for reporters to have access to these stories and to be able to, to talk to people. Um, but we don't ever want to make it seem transactional. That's not, um, that's not what we're about. And that's not what most of these reporters are about either. Um, so that's what I would kind of say to that, but I think, you know, everyone else I'm sure has different experiences. I'm seeing some notes from Isabel in the chat too. Um, and then Aaron, did you have anything else to add to that question? I think that's a really important one. So thank you to the folks who raised that. Um, my only other thing, I agree with all of those points. My only other thing is a, is a punch to that is, I remember at the beginning of the call, I was saying we have a, a series of trainings and one of them, because this is such, is such a challenge and it is also so important um, and it's what reporters are looking for and it's what changes people's minds and what it's what changes policies uh, or these, these vocal voices so we have an upcoming training on that later in the year um, where we are really going to dig into working with local voices um, on both finding them and bringing them in but more importantly making them feel comfortable and equipped to talk to reporters too um, and not putting anybody in a tough spot. Okay, what great training, what great questions. Um, keep them coming, please, as we go through the next part of the training. Uh, I'm gonna turn it to Rosa, who's gonna go through the kind of the what's what of PR tools and, and tactics. Thanks, Erin, um, and thank you all for those really great questions and definitely keep them coming. So um, moving into talking about PR tactics and tools, um, in this section, we'll be talking about what the different tactics are for connecting with reporters, uh, how we can leverage those different tactics, and then when is it best to use a certain tactic. So the first one we'll talk about is reporter briefings. So reporter briefings are a really great tool for introducing your issue or your client or your perspective to reporters. And these um, are most effective in 
advance of you know a report or a major announcement or at least in kind of pre-COVID times um, when individuals, experts or storytellers or advocates were traveling to you know, big media hubs. And if we go to the next slide, we'll dig in a little bit more to reporter briefings. Um, so, you know, reporter briefings are really great for relationship building. They can happen in person or via phone. And there's, you know, many people use reporter briefings on an ongoing basis, but they are especially helpful at the start of a new campaign or initiative, um, just to get folks kind of all on the same page. Um, one thing to know about reporter briefings is that it really kind of takes the pressure off of reporters to write right away. Um, it's not necessarily about one specific story, though it sometimes can result in a story, um, but it's more just helpful information for them to have going forward, especially if you're introducing a campaign or a topic that's going to be relevant for several months or several years. Um, and then reporter briefings are usually more for background, but you should expect it to be on the record. And I want to delve really briefly just into the differences in speaking on background versus on the record versus off the record. And I am sure that this will be repetitive, repetitive for some of you, but in case um, there's folks who aren't clear on these distinctions, I wanted to make sure that we highlight them. So if you are speaking on background, this means, of course, you're giving background information um, and the reporter can publish the information that you have given them but they're not gonna use your name. So you'll see examples in the news um, for background information, like a senior official with the Biden administration or a source close to the matter says, blah, blah, blah. That's kind of how it'll be phrased. Um, so your position might be described, but your actual name won't. If you're talking on the record, um, which is how you should expect these reporter briefings to be, uh, you should expect your name and your title to both be printed. So just really think of this as a public conversation. Kind of the typical rule of thumb here is don't say anything that you wouldn't want to see on the front page of the New York Times. If, if you're on the record, assume that it could be printed there. It's all public. Um, and then if you are speaking off the record, then that information cannot be used for publication. Now, really, really important distinction here is that the terms of your conversation and which um, distinction you're using, whether that's on background, off the record, or on the record, should be negotiated up front. So if you reached out to a reporter and said, you know, in an email, hey, I'd like to speak with you on background about the impact that, you know, Governor Newsom's latest policy proposal is going to have on Bay Area residents who are currently unhoused. You want to make sure that you get agreement from the reporter up front on those terms before you start the conversation. Really typical. And that's sometimes you'll see something kind of bungled in the media. And it's because there will have been tension between the reporter and the source about whether or not they were speaking on background or on the record or off the record. So that's a really, really important thing that you want to be aware of as you're talking to reporters. Um, so we will go to uh, the next slide, the next tactic, which is uh, op-eds and LTEs. And LTEs stands for letters to the editor. Um, and, you know, different kind of strategies and media moments call for different tactics to reach out to the press. Um, so just kind of a, a quick rundown here of, of when to use which one is for editorial kind of outreach like a letter to the editor or an opinion piece is, you know, that's what you use when you want to influence public opinion. The people reading these papers, you want to, you want them to open it up, see that, hear your piece and start to consider the issue in a new light. Um, so there's a couple different versions of this, but we'll talk first about letters to the editor um, and, and op-eds. So letters to the editor can be, you know, really powerful and a great way to shape an opinion. Um, and kind of stake your expertise in a certain issue. And then reporters can, can use you as a source in the future or remember that you wrote this very, you know, um, like strongly worded letter to the editor about a really specific topic. And then they might reach back out to you and say, you know, hey, I saw this a couple of months ago. I'd like to, you know, speak with you more. 
And letters to the editor, this is kind of uh, an important distinction. They're, they're often much shorter than opinion pieces. So letters to the editor are often 150 to 200 words. And because they're shorter, they're you know, easier to write and they're easier to place in papers because um, there's more uh, kind of slots for letters to the editor in an opinion section than there are op-eds. And that, that goes for both online and print. And then if we go to the next slide, we'll compare that to op-eds. Um, those are usually 600 to 800 words. Um, some publications, you know, especially with a, a lot of online readers, will have authors write more than that, maybe up to 2,000. Um, but normally 600 to 800 words is what you'll, you'll use to make your case with an op-ed. Um, so we'll go to the next slide and talk about how you submit an op-ed. And again, I know this is a lot of information, um, and all of this will be in our roundup, so no need to take notes. Um, but the, the first step that you want to do, um, and this will often kind of depend on the outlet and how they prefer to accept opinion pieces, um, but some, some outlets do prefer that you kind of test run the idea by the editors there um, before you write it. So you can kind of pitch it to them, pitch the idea, and they'll let you know, you know whether or not they're interested in seeing it. And I want to you know, really clarify here that when they're agreeing to review it, that's not at all um, an agreement to publish it. They're just saying, sure, you know, we'll take a look. Um, and then the second uh, step here is once you, you know, have some interest or you're going to send it directly to them, depending on the outlet, you're going to draft the op-ed, make sure it includes all of these strong elements of an op-ed, which are included here. Um, you know, important to note here, it's not self-promotional that, you know, an op-ed should really include, um, you know, a new and engaging perspective on something. The third step here, and this is really important, is that you want to submit the op-ed to one outlet at a time. So, you know, before you even submit it, before you even pitch it, probably, what you'll want to do is rank your top three to four choices of which outlet you want the piece to run in. So you want to start by pitching it to your first choice and then wait until you have a response from them or if it's been an appropriate amount of time, and then you can pitch it to another outlet. But you don't want the same piece going out to multiple outlets at the same time, because that can get really messy. Um, so kind of the fourth step here, typically you want to wait about 48 hours after you initially email an op-ed editor. And then if they you know, decide to pass on it, then you can send it on to your second choice, um, and then so on if need be. Um, all right, we will go to the next slide. So another tactic here is editorial outreach. Um, you know, asking an editorial page writer to write um, an editorial on your issue that is supportive of your position. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this in the next slide. So these can take a couple different forms. One could be an editorial board meeting. Um, this is something that, that was often done in person pre-COVID um, or you know, sending along a memo to the editorial board. So regardless of whether you're doing you know, this in person or kind of in, in a memo format, this is what you're, you're gonna wanna do. Most important is really to tailor your outreach um, to the outlet. So you wanna use local data you want to you know, reference or link to recent stories that this outlet has written about the topic and, and really just show that you've done your homework and that you're reaching out to them for a specific reason. If you haven't done your homework, they'll know. <laughs> uh, and you wanna find the right context um, at, at whatever outlet you're going to. And sometimes this can be tricky. At you know, a big outlet, probably the person you wanna to talk to is a beat editorial writer. But if it's a smaller outlet, it might be the uh, executive or deputy editorial board contact. And usually these folks, you know, you can Google around and find it. Um, usually it's accessible. And then, you know, one thing to note is that editorial board contacts are usually not the same people as the op-ed contacts. They might be at a smaller paper, but at a, a larger outlet, those are going to be two different people or two different groups. All right, um, and next we'll talk about broadcast. So, you know, broadcast media means TV, radio, or podcasts. 
Um, and when we're talking about broadcast, we are talking about in-studio interviews, of course, less common right now, or you know, really driving cameras or reporters to your event. So we'll go another slide forward, talk about what broadcast is, is good for. Um, really, broadcast is great if you have strong visuals, if you have issue experts, if you have folks who can give first-person accounts and or in-depth interviews. Um, we've got a section here on in-studio interviews. I'm going to just skip that for now because we're kind of running up against time. But again, this will be in the, the information we send out. Um, but for events, um, one thing is that you really want to play up visuals. So did you find a cool location for the, this event? Are there going to be different community members there? You know, think about how the location connects to your story and really be intentional about that. And you can use that when you're when you're pitching it. One really important thing is that you want to make sure whatever event you're doing is on the news desk's calendar. So what this involves is you want to you know, call and send an email a few days before the event to make sure that they you know, have it on their radar, you've sent them a press release, they have all the information, and then you're going to follow up the day of, and you're going to speak to someone in the newsroom and say, I just want to confirm you've received this information, you know, can you let me know if this is on your news desk calendar? And often they won't make a decision about if someone's available to go until the day of, but regardless, you want to make sure it's on their calendar because if it's not, um, then they won't be there. So I believe this is our last tactic in this part of the presentation is telebriefings, which are pretty much press conferences held over the phone. Um, and if we want to skip ahead one slide, what are telebriefings good for? They are good for getting reporters on the line quickly, especially when they have busy schedules and they're running around. They're really good for convening experts and reporters who are dispersed geographically. Um, so you could you know, hold one event for education reporters, for example, or housing reporters across the country, um, and no one needs to go anywhere for that. And of course, when you don't have the time or the capacity or the money to do a full in-person press event or to, to do multiple interviews, um, they're just telebriefings are a really efficient use of time. So often these are used for breaking news or big announcements or when there's a new report released about something. Um, and unsurprisingly, telebriefings have become much more common in the last year and a half. So there are a number of vendors um, who are able to help with that. Oh, I spoke too soon. We have one more um, uh, tactic in this section, and that is photo desks. So this is, you know, using outreach um, to um, ask photographers to attend and cover an event. So of course, this is great if you have uh, an on-the-ground event with really strong visuals. Um, again, like um, you know, other tactics here, you want to really plan ahead of time, make sure you're on the AP Daybook, which is an event planning calendar. And then also just know that photographers are not always accompanied by reporters. They are sent out to events on their own often. Um, so if you want to really, you know, pitch that specifically, find the photographer contact at the outlet and you can reach out to them directly. And you can reach out to the newsroom if need be but don't hesitate to, to reach out to the person that, that you want at that event. All right, um, so this concludes this section. Um, and I know there have been some questions going in the chat. Um, so let me take a quick look Let's see. I'm seeing one, how worthwhile do you find press events to be these days, especially in person during COVID, even in normal times, it seems like an awful lot of effort for often minimal returns. Uh, yes, this is a great question. Um, and, you know, I think it really depends on kind of kind of what your event is and, and what new information you have to share and if there's really a visual element to, to it. So I think, you know, if you were doing a story about, um, you know, folks who are unhoused and living in a certain area and you were going to kind of highlight what that looked like or what life was like for people who are, who are struggling with this and, and, and folks you know, had agreed for there to be a visual element, all of that, then you know, that's, that's value added. But if there's not really a visual element to that, um, 
then, you know, I would say you can certainly kind of conserve, you know, your, your time and energy and reporters time and energy, especially if you're doing outreach to reporters across the Bay and you know that it would be hours of traffic for them. You know, I've certainly had reporters at events grumble about, you know, like, oh, did we need to come out all this way for, for this? I've, I've overheard that for sure. So I think it's just, you know, kind of a case by case basis, but it's a great question and definitely don't feel like you always need to default to an in-person event if you think that you can pull off the event, um, you know, just as just as well without that. Um, that's what I would say to that question. I know we've got a couple others coming through. Um, Aaron, would you add anything to that question about in-person events? I totally echo it. I feel like COVID is the, it's been really the, the turning the corner away from in-person events and the telebriefing. I think even when it's safe to gather in person again, I think reporters are gonna just would much rather dial into the Zoom webinar for 30 minutes, get what they need, and then be at their desks already to work on the next piece. Great, thank you. So I'm looking over here at the other questions. Let's see. Um, we've got op-eds in our organization are collaborative efforts. At times they take a long time to finalize. What, what criteria do you use to gauge how long the window of interest from reporters will last? Um, another great question. Um, you know, I think there's kind of two different um, elements often to kind of news topics. One is, is called evergreen. So something that is kind of always going to be relevant. And then, of course, there's there's something that's related to news specifically happening kind of like this week. And so I would say the first thing to do um, is, you know, kind of gavel down on if your topic is something that's evergreen. And if you think, you know, reporters are still going to be talking about it versus if you think, you know, oh, I think the, the Bay Area media will have moved on um, on this topic. So I think, you know, if we're talking about housing in the Bay Area, to me, that's an evergreen topic. There might be subtopics in there of, you know, specific issues, specific cities, ordinances, maybe a city council vote is taking place, and those, you would want to get those in a really timely manner. Um, but there's, there's often ways to make the topic evergreen and, and link it back to past coverage. Um, but, you know, in general, I would say for submitting an op-ed, um, it is to your advantage to submit it in a timely manner. It's always to your advantage to be on the ball and say, you know, hey, we saw the article you published on Monday. We wanted to send a follow-up kind of reaction in this op-ed. Here you go. Um, and editors will pay attention to that. They like to have kind of coverage that connects back to what they just talked about. Um, but I, I totally understand the concern. I know op-eds can take a long time to put together. Um, so one sort of um, way to navigate around that is to have um, kind of evergreen pieces of op-eds in place that are already approved you know, by the full group so that when you wanna put an op-ed in place and quickly, sorry, put an op-ed in place quickly, you already have some elements to refer back to and some pre-approved language so that it makes that process go a little faster. Um, that's one tool that I've found to be um, effective. Um, Aaron, anything else to add on that topic? Only that, just like commiserate with the struggle of <laughs> getting an op-ed across the finish line and then uh, published. It is just really crowded. So those letters to the editor may be your better bet. Um, there's more placements for them and they take a lot less time to create. Um, the other question I'm seeing here, please keep on coming. We've got a few more minutes, but I might skip ahead because um, there's a question about press releases. And I love this question because I am loving the, the move away from press releases. <laughs> it's uh, reporters, it, you know, if you have something new or you really want to make sure reporters have all of the background information about an issue, they can be useful. Most of the time, they can just really add up a lot of time for your communications team, um, and reporters don't really regard them. Um, and they'd rather just have an email and then maybe a supporting quote that's in the email that they can include in the story. So I'll just, just give a little preview. We'll send this deck around, but um, we're not going to have enough time to get too into the details about 
pitching reporters, but this is an example um, of what we sent to reporters last month around uh, a new report that was coming out um, about wages and housing costs across the country. And of course, the Bay Area was at the top of the list. Um, so we didn't include press release. <laughs> there was one, um, but we didn't, we didn't include it because instead of what reporters really wanted was just like, hey, this is here. And then we replied with some key things for them to know in the email itself um, and some supporting quotes from organizations uh, to bring the community voices forward. So um, the more you can keep things short and sweet to Rose's earlier point with reporters, the better and press releases really aren't great at being short and sweet. Um, so following this kind of format instead could be way more useful. <laughs> yes, RIP press release, not sorry about it. Um, and then just to jump in on that, I think part of the question to like our attachments and issue with press releases and um, yes, sometimes they definitely can be, especially as kind of email settings get more sophisticated. And so we have seen um, people really move away from including press releases as attachments when you do have something more formal to announce and you are doing a press release, um, just pasting it into the body of the email is going to be a lot, um, a lot more um, of a guaranteed way to make sure that the reporter actually sees it versus if it's an attachment, it could be blocked or go into spam or just be filtered out. So um, great question. And I would say um, steer clear of attachments. And I know we are just about at time here. Um, and if folks do have more questions and are able to stay on, we do have a few minutes of flex time. So, um, you know, if you if you've got to go now, um, thank you for being here. Thank you for all the great questions and engagement. And, you know, we will follow up next week with all this information. Um, but if you do have other questions and would like to just chat a little bit more, feel free to to stay on. We'll stay on for a few minutes just to answer any other questions. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. One question I am seeing coming here is it's really critical and we'll follow up in the email response too with the other materials just so that everyone has has our thoughts about it. But um, tips for pitching and connecting with ethnic media. Um, the, there's no one size fits all answer here because there's just so many, well, first of all, there's not, there's not as many um, I think media outlets, community outlets as, as there once were, which is unfortunate. But um, one thing that we have found is having, again, this goes back to having those local impacted community voices, that really matters. It matters for, you know, San Francisco Chronicle too, but um, having people who can speak on behalf of the community that is the audience for that, for that outlet is gonna be extra important. Um, so making sure you've got either spokespeople, not necessarily even just speaking of the language, if it's a non-English language outlet, but um, spokespeople who who can speak with, with that authority from what it's like from in the community. Um, so that's one thing, just making sure you've got those the community impacted voices to go along with with what you're trying to place for a new story. Um, and then when it comes to language barriers, we have found that most of the time, um, the communication with reporters can be done in English, uh, even if the story appears in a different language than English. Um, so there's definitely gonna be exceptions to that, but by and large, uh, we have found that the communicating with reporters in English um, when reaching out to community outlets works most of the time. And I did see another question in the chat a little bit earlier about um, for broadcast media, any tips for radio versus TV? Um, I would say um, one thing that I've found to be true is that I, I do think it's often easier to um, kind of book radio interviews than it is to book a TV interview. Um, and especially with the number of radio programs, um, you know, in the, in the Bay Area and folks who specialize in certain topics, um, I think sometimes you can get, you can be a little bit more intentional in your pitching than you can be um, with TV. So I would say TV, I would 
almost save your outreach for the, the biggest stories that you have. If you're, you know, kind of regularly pitching TV reporters on, on kind of small potatoes things, um, you know, you might not um, get as much kind of attention from them is as if you wait until you have kind of a really big deal thing, you know, a, a, um, a high profile person or something related to a new policy, you know, something that that's really timely that they are going to you, you think the news is going to cover this no matter what, and we have a unique perspective and they should share it, then you can sort of pitch to that angle, whereas radio, they, you know, often have um, I think more sometimes free space to fill and they have, you know, programs designed to include guests regularly. Um, of course, TV has to contend with breaking news all the time, um, and that's not most radio programs. So I would say try radio first and try to really find, um, you know, folks, find whether that's kind of um, reporters or, or producers that you can make a really specific pitch to and, and kind of exhaust your options there. Because I would say, and, and Aaron, feel free to jump in here, but I would say if you pitch something and no one who works um, at a radio program is taking it, you probably aren't going to get a TV station to take it. I think TV to me is a kind of um, higher, higher bar than radio to clear. Um, but Aaron, definitely interested in your perspective too, if you want to weigh in. I echo everything. <laughs> no, no extra. That, that's exactly what I was thinking too. Great. Um, okay. Just monitoring like the chat question here. stream is yeah trickled. Uh, well, if anybody's still out there, uh, we are. We'll be on that Slack channel that, that Rosa was promoting earlier. So other questions, please keep them coming. We'll always be there for when things pop up and you're wondering about. Um, and we'll follow up these materials in the next week. All right. Thanks, everybody.